Great. Hello and welcome to the next episode, episode 101 actually, of Cylinder Radio. I'm your host, Will Roosh, teacher in Los Angeles. I've uh, been teaching for 16 years in various high schools and stuff like that. And today we're going to revisit a topic that I've covered a couple of times, which is education. And I'm really thrilled to have my guest today, who is Dr. Hollis Robbins, who's an academic and a professor. She is the Dean of the School of Arts and Humanities at Sonoma State, Uni or Sonoma State University. Um, and she uh, has a background in African-American literature. And I found her on this thing that a, a, a high school buddy sent me uh, that's about expertise. It was titled 21 Experts on Expertise. And her, um, her uh, uh, section was called, We Can't Distinguish Good Teachers. And I was like, okay, well, uh, making better education is something I'm interested in. And uh, what she had to say, I just aligned with so much. And having a podcast allows me to say, hey, can I actually have a formal conversation with you? So we're having the conversation. Hollis, thank you so much for being here. I am thrilled to, to pick your brain about how we can get better education, essentially. Well, I'm delighted to be here. I was delighted when you when you reached out, and I always love to talk about teachers with teach uh, to, with about teaching with teachers. Well, thank so. you for saying that because it's actually something that I've brought up before. Is there so many? I hear people talking about education and teachers and teachers of this teachers that, but not with teachers, and it's very frustrating for me. It's like, why aren't you talking to me about this stuff? Exactly. Or people talk about schools failing, right? Schools. Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah, no, or classrooms or this or that. No, the question of, and there really isn't a lot of good literature that talks about what makes good teaching, right? Now there's, there's the evidence of the teaching, right? Which is like the test scores or this or the, that, but that's something else, right? That's not the teaching itself, right? What it is that comes out of my mouth or the, out of my writing or pen or some other way that gets into your head, not just into your ears or into your eyes, yeah. but into your head and that you carry it with you when you've walked out the door, right? What is it? And, you know, even if we, you know, sort of assess good teaching by test scores, there's a certain kind of time limit, like, okay, the end of the semester or the end of the month or the end of the week, what have you learned? What do you remember 10 years from now? Yeah. And one of the things, as you know, you said you've been doing this for 16 years, mm -hmm. you've probably got that wonderful, wonderful um, uh, experience of having a, t t uh, having a student who knew you some years ago saying, oh, I remember you, Mr. Osh, you know, you know, like you taught me this thing and it, I've never forgotten it, right? This happens to me a lot. Oops, hang on, let me turn off my phone. This happens to me from time to time and it's excellent. Let me, can I tell you a little story? Please, yeah. So I was once at jury duty and I'm sitting in jury duty and this was in Baltimore and I'd seen a student that I had 10 years before and I hadn't seen her since. And she came over and she sat next to me and she said, Dr. Robbins, I'm so excited that I'm seeing you here because you're the person that taught me about evil. Huh. And I'm like, like, wait, wait, what? When did I do that? And she said, well, Shakespeare and Moby Dick and all the great books that you taught. Like, I really understood that there's actually evil in the world. Oh. <laughs> sort of not expecting to hear this in jury duty of all places, yeah, yeah. but anyway. Well, yeah, I mean, I think we aim for the, to have the big takeaways. And I was, I was just saying to my class today, you know, like, I, I don't expect you to know every detail or remember every detail, but if you can just remember this one, one chunk, one chunk from today's when you're 35 years old, that's a huge win for me because we generally don't remember anything. Exactly. Exactly. If they remember your name, it's good. But to, to have to, to lodge that little bit in their, in their brain that they come back to or that they make work for you. Um, obviously, I taught this, this young woman more than evil, but I taught her yeah. how to think about the world and yeah. how to think about that there's something other than good, right? That there are distinctions and that the, there are ways of operating through the world, understanding these concepts. Yeah. So I, when I read uh, what you wrote, just that little, that little, like, um, it was, it was more short. It was like three paragraphs or something like that. I was like, wow, she really gets it about education. So can you bring me into what's your background that you, you, you seem to get it in a way that a lot of people don't. <laughs> so what, what is your background that makes you an expert on, on teaching? 
Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I, I get, came to the classroom late. I came to education early, or at least college education early. I grew up in New Hampshire. You know, it was very rural, and and the schools weren't great. I had a couple of teachers that, like one teacher that taught me about uh, the French Revolution that I've always remembered her discussion of Talleyrand, right? It just stuck in my head. And I had another teacher who was uh, had a class on Lord of the Rings, like long before it was a big deal. So, you know, certain things stuck in my head. Um, I was, I had the opportunity, um, because I was good at math, to go off to college early uh, at age 16 at to Johns Hopkins, which is great, but I didn't really want to do math. And I started taking some philosophy classes and psychology classes. And I had a professor who, um, who had the quote that I used in the A16 uh, Z piece on expertise from Jean Piaget, who was at age 15, the world's expert on freshwater mollusks. And, and he was a kid who just was obsessed with freshwater mollusks, had gone to the library, found there wasn't a lot of literature about it, and started writing papers and submitting these to, to journals. And you know, that then went on to do many things, and you probably know him as a philosopher of education. Yeah. But one of the things he said is he said, if you become a world's expert on one thing, you can become a world's expert on anything because what you've done is you've learned how to organize your mind, right? You've learned how to process information, organize information, have taxonomies, classification systems, and that you then have a retrieval system in your brain, right? So that when you take things in, you can also retrieve them. And this retrieval system is something that we don't really teach very much. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I did a whole bunch of things. I ended up not back in the classroom until a 35 year old graduate. I was a grad student okay. and okay. I walked in the classroom. It's like my first time as a grad school teacher. And I was like, this is, this is it. Why did it take so long? And I'm going to do this for the rest of my life. You know what? This is, this is cool because um, I'm someone that I, I always try to um, seek disconfirmation to challenge my ideas, but you just gave me a great nugget of confirmation bias. One of the things I do in my senior level civics class, it's a civics class. So we're learning, you know, citizenship and things, and it's trying to bootstrap a better society. And I got to write the class myself and everything like that. I, I love it. It's my, it's my baby. But one of the things I give them the first week of school is a project that's a year long project called the process project. I show them a clip from like the matrix where she says like, I want to learn how to fly the helicopter and her eyes flutter. And all of a sudden she can have it. And I was like, this is the way the world works. It just takes longer. And what I have them do is pick a quantifiable act that they are bad at and want to get better at. It could be running a mile. It could be the Rubik's cube. It could be a handstand. I don't care. I tell them, I don't care what it is, but something. And then you document it the entire year with these checkpoints. And by the end of the year, you will be good at something you were terrible at because just like you said, if you can do this with something, you can do it with anything. And I want you, we're gonna be talking about ways we can bootstrap a better society. And it, it, when people say that's impossible, well, if I looked at someone walking on their hands right now as me, I would go, that's impossible. But then you make it possible. You go, what else could I possibly do? That process project. and. And um, yeah, that's so cool that that's like confirms that like, okay, that's, that's something positive that I'm doing. Well, I think focusing really, really focusing in on something. And again, all of my, ex all of my expertise or all of my experience teaching is at the college level. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I've done a lot of college of first year students. And so I have a sense of high school. Yeah. Right. I have a sense of high school because I can tell, for example, sometimes with the homeschoolers, uh, the kids who are homeschooled, they don't write their names on their papers. And that the reason is because they don't have to. Yeah. Their mom knows yeah. who, who it is. <laughs> um, but you can you can sometimes tell. And um, years ago, uh, when I was teaching in Jackson, Mississippi, I had was teaching a class that was a research methods class. And they could I said, you know, you can write on anything. Just write on anything. Yeah. And I had a student who wanted to write on how, oh, I'm going to forget their names. If they're not corn chips. What are the puffy ones? Oh, uh, um, like cheese puffs or cheese, something like that? Yeah, cheese puffs or Cheetos, Cheetos? or something yeah. like that. He said, I want to write about how Cheetos are made, which turns out I gave me this five page paper on what's called extruded food pro products, right? I forget the name of it, but I will always remember the extruded food products how there's a whole bunch of foods that you've got like this thing with holes in them and that you you extrude them and 
you know, this kid was not maybe what I would have thought was going to be the top kid in the class, yeah. but this paper that he wrote on Cheetos, on extruded cheat products, the invention thereof, and how they have changed our food, this kid is going on to have a better life because he had that experience of going really deep into a subject. Yeah, I mean, he, he cared. So uh, what I want to get into is talking about great teachers. So here's kind of where my head's at, and then I want to just hand it off to you and let you run with it. Um, is I, how, what, what, first of all, what makes a great teacher? My idea is that teachers are interpreters and that's our job is to not just have the information because the information on your, you can Google everything. This has a lot more information than I do. So it's how do I relate that to you, my student that I actually know personally, I have a lunch with a different student every single day. I get to know them well. And the, what, what started this was the job that I'm at now, at the private school I'm at now, it was between me and someone with a Harvard PhD in history. And I just am here with a bachelor's from, from a state school in Pennsylvania. And we did our sample lessons and I got the job over him. Now, why? Well, because the, the um, chair, department chair said you could convey the information better to young people. You can kind of speak their language, so to speak. So that's kind of my idea of, of what makes a great teacher. And I guess I'll just stop there. But then I, I want to ask you, like, how do we get more or gatekeepers? But what, do you, what are your thoughts on, on that hypothesis in my approach? I think you're exactly right, right? You, you meet the student where they are. And they're so wonderful, as long as you're, you're teaching in an Orthodox Jewish school. Yeah, I am. Now I'm at an Orthodox Jewish school, which I don't know if my audience is, is um, privy to that. But like, it's, it's very strange for me because I went to public school my whole life. I taught at public schools in really tough neighborhoods and everything like that. And then I just wanted to do me. I wanted to write a class that like, I could just teach it my way. And I couldn't find a place to allow me to do that. Definitely LAUSD wouldn't allow me to do that. So I went to this place and it was like, yeah, hey, Mr. Roosh go do your thing. And it's working really well. It's also why I can push back on things that a lot of my friends and, and peers and stuff can't push back on. But yes, I'm at like a modern Orthodox Jewish school now, which has been a wonderful experience for me. Well, there's, there's a, um, I mean, the Bible um, is, is or, and I'll talk, call the Old Testament, what I call the Bible, is, uh, is great about teaching, right? And I think for this school to have chosen you for those reasons, really speaks to actually that feeling of, or that sense of you as a connector, right? Right. That connection is really important. And one of my favorite <clears throat> uh, Bible verses um, for, uh, for teaching is uh, Genesis 17, 20. And it is at, after Sarah has thrown Hagar and Ishmael into the, into the desert. I think that's the, the verse. Um, and, uh, you know, Hagar's there, and we don't know how old Ishmael is, and he's crying, and there's no water, and she sits down and puts him away, and he, she comes over here, and she's like, God, you know, you, the, the, if my son is going to perish. Where are you? And God says to her, her I will hear him where he is. Mm -hmm. I will hear him where he is. Like, I'm not going to hear him where you are. Yeah. Right? I'm hearing him where he is. And it always stuck out to me. I once heard a, a rabbi give a sermon on it and it stuck with me, right? You hear people where they are, right? With their biases, with where their issues, with their baggage, with their enthusiasms. And so if you're speaking to them, right? And you're respecting that, you're not any kid right? You're not the kid who's in that role. You're you. And if I can he see you and respect you for your individuality and to interpret or just even just convey the lesson to you, that's good for me and it's good for you. And that, that's hard to scale is the problem. And that's, I think, where ed tech is, is, is going to have a challenge. Well, that's that I do want I, I want to touch on. I wrote that down in my notes. I think um, before I get to that, because I do want to talk about that in depth, um, is how so how do we get more good teachers? If they could be out there, but I guess 
and it, this kind of could go into scale, but there are certain gates to get, allow you to be a teacher. You have to be college educated. You have to, you know, have certain things. You have to get these credentials and things like that. Um, but again, it's hard to really like recognize a good teacher. Like what do you do if you're the best in your field at many things, whether it's, you know, it could be in business or athletics or, you know, a, a, a law or whatever. If you're like the best, the, the market comes into play and you are kind of recognized in some way. But if you're the best nurse or you're the best firefighter or you're the best teacher, it's very difficult to kind of like, before we get to scale, even just like incentivize, is it, is it a money thing to you? Cause it's not for me. It's not, a, I, you don't get into teaching for the money. You get into it more, I think for the freedom. When people say you need to teach, pay teachers better. Uh, sure. I'll take it. And yes, that could get people to, to, to enter it. I don't know to what degree, but I think that it's, it's a lot of people want to want to do it for the freedom to do what you want to do. At least it was for me. Do you think it's a money issue? How do we get great teachers into the profession and kind of reward the best teachers? Cause it's so hard to measure. Yeah. And I, I, for I, the I long say, game, right? Yeah. No, I think there's a bunch of things. It's, it's the, it's really the, the challenge for us. Um, for, I, I think money and status matter, right? And, and they matter a lot for a lot of people. Um, you know, I, I had school loans. Uh, you know, I wanted to do something that would pay off my school loans. And, um, you know, teaching until I went to grad school and found myself in the classroom, I don't think I would have ever found myself in the classroom. And again, I don't really know. We value some professions like doctors and lawyers and engineers more than teachers. I mean, I think about, I've got two kids, they're 27 and 29, one's a lawyer, one's an engineer, both great kids um, uh, and both great teachers in their way, right? Teachers of their colleagues, of their teams, um, but would never have gone into teaching. Um, I don't, I'm not sure why, it just wasn't for them. Um, so I don't know, but I, I do think, um, I think financial s stability matters. Yeah. And I think, um, it, let me ask you something. Yeah, so yeah. you're, degree you said at Penn State was in education. Secondary education, social studies, yeah. So, um, and I'm here in, in California. I have 10 departments. A couple of the departments have teacher tracks for students who are gonna go on to be teachers because again, I'm not an expert on California law of, of, um, of teaching law, but there's, it's fairly rigorous on the kinds of degree you have to be and then your teaching waiver and certificate in order to teach this or that, right? You have yeah. to have some training. Um, so if you, you know, decide you want to be a historian or an English major, and then you want to go into the classroom later, reconfiguring your certification is sometimes unwieldy, right? Yeah. And you know, this seems to be when we were chatting right beforehand, you're, even though you were, you were wanted to be a teacher, right? Um, you also have subject matter expertise, but you also had some pushback against the sort of configuration, the regulatory framework of certification. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, there was a lot of, um, at these charter schools that I was at, one of them was a Bill and Melinda Gates school. It just, it was clearly the setup was not designed by classroom teachers. It was people that said, here's the way you, we're going to teach and we're going to have 48 kids per room and we're going to divide up into three groups of 16. And I was doing this in a, in a neighborhood that my principal who opened up a charter school in Watts said made Watts look like Disneyland. So these kids needed a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. They needed to have seven kids in a classroom where I could connect with them, not 48 with you know, right. 10 of them have ankle bracelets on and there's three pregnant girls. And like, it just, it was, it was, it was a mess. And, and yet we had to get these test scores to get funding to prove that the model is working through test scores. But we're in this for the long haul. It's nice to, to get a test score. It's nice to have 16 year olds say, Mr. Roosh, you're my favorite teacher. It's way bigger. Like you said, when you run into someone 10, 15 years later, who said you had even just a sliver to do with like my success or happiness or something like that. You'd add a little bit to do with that. That goes so long, but how do you quantify that? If you're the best firefighter or nurse, it's kind of the kind of the back to my same question. Is it tenure and union? Are those 
you know, there's really important to have unions to, to get us to a, pl a place where it's like a, a livable salary, but have they gone too far where the teachers are kind of um, disincentivized to, to, to grow? I don't know. I, I don't know. And I, and I wish I had a better answer for you on this because I, all I can think of is I can only, like I spend a lot of time on the micro issues, right? Yeah. I, and the macro issues of teaching um, elude me because uh, all I can do is sort of support you. You know, as a dean, I'm not often in the classroom. I'll be in the classroom in the spring teaching a poetry class. But what I do is I support my chairs. I support my teaching. Right now, we're trying to do the online versus in person, right? And so we spend a lot of time on the pedagogy, right? So for example, I have a great teacher who's an art historian. And, you know, always part of the pedagogy and the practice of teaching art history is you've got slides on the front of the classroom. It used to be slides with a slide projector and then was like the PowerPoint. Okay. Well, now here, share screen, right? And in fact, in some ways, then you can put your face up to the camera and you can, and you, and I mean, up to the screen and you could see the close up. The pedagogy is such that teaching some art history online when you're doing some close reading of some visual objects is kind of preferable yeah right and other discussions we can figure out but again it's saying okay what how is the modality and the teacher but you know getting away from the back to the the teaching itself rather than the pedagogy you know i support those individual efforts by individual teachers to do better um I'm not. I'm not sure. I have a good answer to the to the broader question of bringing more people into the into the profession. They may just not know it. Okay, let me ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. From your years teaching, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering if our numbers are the same. How many, or what percentage of teachers, any age, any grade, are really good? <laughs> um, uh, well, here's what it's, I'll I'll say not. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to say because I'm not in all the classrooms. And here's, here's what, why it's a tricky question. Um, is it's like, is this person a great swimmer? Okay, maybe, but they're in a really, really cold pool and the pool is really shallow and they keep bumping their hands on the ground because it's only a two foot deep pool. It's hard to say because I've been in so many teaching situations where the, the situation was so bad that I couldn't really tell if they were good or not. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, okay, but, but you grew up, you, you went to school. Oh, oh, of the teachers I've had? Well, I mean, that's part of it too, what percent? Very small, because I didn't have a single teacher that really resonated with me, and then every school I'm at, there are a handful, so let's, I mean, I would say it's like 10% or less. Okay, that good, like that was 10%, good. exactly. Okay, yeah. here's that, right? That is where we should be talking. Okay, 90% okay. of teachers are not very good. Yeah. I think now it's funny, I was, um, I was talking to my daughter who's a lawyer and we were talking about somebody and I had to get talk to a lawyer about something, real estate deal. And she said, well, it doesn't seem like he's a very good lawyer, right? And you don't wanna think about that. Like, ooh, <laughs> how can you tell a not very good lawyer from so a good lawyer, though. right? Or if you go to the doctor, Doctors. we all hear, right? Yes. <laughs> right. Well, okay. Let's agree that it's about ten percent that are really good. Yeah. Now, what does that mean? Like, why then are there so few studies about what makes the good ones good? That's that's the question. That's yeah. Really so let me ask you, you're in the academic world. You are like, why is this not being studied in the social sciences of what makes great teaching and how do we bootstrap it? Because look, I, I, I'm obviously, I have my, my like bias because I think good educators will change the world and get rid of all of these problems. The polarization we're seeing, all this kind of stuff can be fixed with good education and critical thinking and having children grow up to be courageous and curious and all the stuff fighting back against the John Haidt, you know, uh, coddling of the American mind stuff, all of that can be fixed with good education. So why aren't we focusing on that? Is it, is it the market? What? Well, it's a couple of things. Let's, okay, yeah. let's start out with the supply. Okay. Okay. Uh, Cause we started with supply, bringing mm -hmm. more people into the supply. Yes. There are two things. There's expertise and then there's good teaching, mm -hmm. right? So that's part of the issue. 
right? Now you, what would you say your expertise is, your subject matter expertise? You said social studies? It's, it's social studies. So I, I've taught pretty much everything in it except for psychology. Sociology, um, geography, uh, US history, world history, um, civics, economics, government, all okay. that stuff. But my, my now that's expert, great. Okay. Yeah, go on. No, no, no go on. My expertise though is I am, I'm not great at any of those really. I'm good at explaining complex things to teenagers. Okay. My, I'm surrounded now I'm at this private school where there's a lot of people with PhDs and they're experts. The, the, the um, department chair at my school is a history buff, just loves the Civil War, knows who all the generals were and who their wives' names were and who flanked. I don't know any of that, but I can read it and I can explain it in a way that a 16-year-old goes, I got it. See, that, that's great. Okay, that's your superpower. So let me, let me, let me step back for a second. So, um, so how much, have you ever read Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle? Um, I, I'm, I'm familiar with it. I don't know if I've, I've, I've ever okay, read it. Okay, so you would know. No. Okay, yeah, so let me I'm tell you. So this guy, you know who Darwin is. So yes, I'll give you that one. So, all right. So he's growing up and he's really, really good at collecting things, right? There's all these stories about him, like going around and collecting stuff. Like, and he's got his handful of beetles. There's this famous story and he sees one more beetle that he hasn't ever seen before. And he pops it in his mouth because he has no, no place else to, to collect yeah. Anyway, he goes off to school, goes off to college. His dad wants him to be a doctor. He faints when he sees somebody getting cut open. It's like, not, that's not going to work. And he's kind of dropping out. He really doesn't know. But he follows some of his teachers around. And the teachers that he follows around are the ones that are going to work in the tide pools, collecting specimens, right? Mm -hmm. The naturalists, the people who are, who are kind of doing the stuff he wanted to do. Anyway, he dropped out. His dad was like, you know, what's, what's a good, what, what good are you going to be? And his uncle said, look, let me get him a gig. And he ends up getting a gig as the ship's naturalist on a ship called the HMS Beagle going off to, uh, Travel to all around, the, right? yeah, yeah. To, to do the borders of South America. Right. And here's the thing. If he had been a zoologist, he would have just studied the animals. Mm. If he'd been a botanist, he would have just studied the plants. If he'd been a freshwater mollusk guy like Piaget, he would just would have done that. The thing is, he was a collector, right? So he like I've never seen that before. Let me draw it. He was good at drawing it. He was good at preserving things. He was good at packing them in straw and sending them back. This is 1830 something uh -huh. back to London, and most of his stuff got there well preserved, right? So he was a he wasn't an expert on any of these little things. But like you, <laughs> he was an expert at kind of handling all of these things, right? And yeah. explaining them and drawing them. And, you know, went, did the circuit around, uh, around South America, went inland, did all this stuff. You should read the Beagle. Also, he was an amazing writer. Gets around to the Galapagos, right? Where the finches and the tortoises, and he kind of starts like, huh. This is odd, <laughs> yeah, the right? Beaks of the finches, right? How the right, right. But he doesn't. Yeah. It's not until he gets back to England and like the Royal Society is like, look at all this stuff, where he looks at all the stuff that he got and collected. And that's where his expertise is, mm -hmm. right? And he's that's when he begins to process the data and says, you know, something happened here. How did this get to this? This theory of evolution. So what I mean to say is his expertise was diffuse but it was expertise nonetheless yeah. right right but we don't think that way so let me go back then okay. i have subject matter expertise right and i have very deep subject matter expertise i just wrote a book on the african-american sonic tradition and uh i'm probably no not probably definitely one of the top three people in the world who know this i am the one of the top three experts in the world on this very tiny little thing yeah. Okay. What has that done for me? I've, I've, you know, I've spent years of my life on this subject. It's how I organize my brain. But that part of me is not the teaching part of me. So the two of us are probably good teachers. Let's yeah. take this as a self-assessment. You've got diffuse knowledge. I've got very organized, deep knowledge. Yeah. That has nothing to do with the fact that we're good teachers. And that's part of the issue right, is that we conflate questions, and this is what happens at the university, we, we conflate um, or confuse subject matter expertise, which is why you hire somebody in college, from their ability over here. Yeah. I think at, at different levels, 
Um, we don't, I, I'm not sure we, I'm not even sure how that's done, right? Because how, how do you choose? Like in like the K through 12 system, I mean, if, across the country, a lot of it is just, I mean, it's, it's, it's your grades. How did you do in, 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 uh, in college and your education classes and stuff like that. It's who do you know, but it's not even like you have to be an expert. I think at private schools and stuff like that, it is because it's like more of a, of like a free market, so to speak, which one am I going to send my kid to? Oh, the one that has more PhDs or something. But a lot of um, the public schools, it's not, it's just like, Hey, we, we have openings. You're a math teacher. We need a math teacher. All good. A lot more of that. Right. So oh, you're not yeah. judging subject, subject matter expertise and you're not judging teaching expertise. Not really. No. Right. So it's interesting. We came to the same figure of 10% yeah, yeah. because yeah. I would say I know a lot of my teachers, my the faculty are really great subject matter expertise, have great subject matter expertise. So yeah. the amount of it that gets into the student's head, you know, may differ at the quality of the teaching, but there's enough expertise. It's going to be okay. Yeah. Right. But if they had diffuse expert, if they had diffuse knowledge and weren't great teachers, that I think is the what's going on. Well, yeah. And it's hard too, because the way that you quantify a lot of this is through standardized testing. But a lot of that is the very, like the expertise to some, it's, it's the, it's the trees, not the forest. And I, I think good education is, like you said, like it's, it's the idea of being able to see the big picture of things. One of the first things I do in my U.S. history class is, I, I pick a movie that everyone's seen in the class. So it's like usually Finding Nemo or Frozen or something like that. And then I just do a basic breakdown of the, of the movie over the course of like two minutes. Cause I've seen the movie enough that I can just like kind of run through the plot. And I'm like, did I say what Anna and Elsa's mom's name was? They're like, no, it's like, right. Cause it doesn't really matter. It's great. And it's, it's good information that could help the story along, but it doesn't, what really matters is these big themes that you're going to carry with you out into the world so that you can make sense of the future uh, by studying the past or something along those lines. And I don't, I think that that's harder to quantify. It's harder to quantify oh. in a measurable way, the forest, it's easier to do the trees because it's a multiple choice test and you can scale that. So I think now it's coming to me, I think you're an expert in classification systems or taxonomies, right? Because, you know, I, I think there was you know, back in the day, the old fashioned day when there was only one gender, and it was men. Um, you know, I had a, a teacher in, in middle school was talking about the various plots, right? Boy meets girl, boy loses right. girl, boy gets girl, man versus nature, man versus machine, right, right, right. And, you know, whatever. I wasn't, stuff, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I wasn't, I mean, I didn't fight about the gender back then, but, but I was just like, oh, that's interesting. That's a classification system. I can start thinking about this. I remember it, and I'm probably a little bit on the on the autism spectrum a little bit, but I remember just loving the Dewey Decimal System. Oh, like, interesting. Wow. You it, made, it, was, it was organized. It made sense. Yes. It, it like, structured here's it. the fiction. Yeah. Here's the literature. Here's the stuff on art. Here's the stuff on music. Here's the stuff on that. And let's say the idea that somebody came up with the idea that you're not going to have all the books in one place, mm -hmm. right? And, and the idea of classification systems and, um, uh, and notation systems, or the idea of competing classification systems, like, or, or other systems like metric versus, you know, what, I'm forgetting what ours is called, right? Um, like this was of interest to me. And it sounds like actually you are a teacher of how to organize knowledge. Yeah, maybe. I never thought about it that way, but maybe, you know, I'm thinking like school is supposed to be life practice, life prep. And that's the way I, I, I talk about my, with my students and a lot of my students are like, but most of our classes, I don't connect with my life at all. And I say, and this, some of my colleagues don't like me for this. I'm like, well, challenge them. I was like, look, no matter what I'm teaching, I could be teaching anything in any of these classes. If you don't connect this with your life, or I'm not able to do that, raise your hand and say, Mr. Roosh, why should I know this? As a 16 year old in Los Angeles, how will this help me? And if I can't answer that question, then I'm not doing my job. I, if, and it's, it's shocking to me how many teachers can't answer that question. Uh, yeah, Mr. Math teacher, why should we learn algebra? How will learning algebra help me as a 16 year old to get the, what I want out of my life?
and, and so, the, the answers are, are really frustrating for me. It's like, so you can get into college, so you can, you know, exercise your brain. So, so the way I, and, and, and you're asking the right questions, right? Yeah. And the way I, I think about it is, um, is asking why, why are we studying this bef at all, right? So, mm -hmm. like, so if you're in botany or in zo zoology, like how long, right? There'd be this classification of learning knowledge called natural philosophy, really, which was about, you know, rocks and flora and fauna and this and that. And it's, classification systems called like philosophy. What is philosophy? So for example, my field, which is English literature, really didn't become a field until the late 19th century. So if I'm teaching literature, and it's English literature largely, I say, well, before that literature meant the classics. Right. Yeah. And it wasn't really until more middle class people started going to universities and, you know, didn't have their Latin and Greek but could be thinking about things like themes and character and plots, but we're doing it with Shakespeare or Chaucer or Wordsworth or Byron or what have you. And it'd be like, okay, we've got another degree. We're going to call it English literature, right? And suddenly a field is born. Mm -hmm. Now my smaller field, which is African-American literature, really starts with Phyllis Wheatley, right? In 1773, the first book of poems she published, right? So there's actually, like what I find really interesting about African American literature is that it's a fairly limited, circumscribed yeah. field, right? And I know a lot in it, right? And I know who wrote in reaction to whom and who influenced whom, right? Imagine any, you can't have a petri dish like that in English literature, there's too much. You can't do that in American literature. Some people try to do it in Irish literature, but that's kind of complicated too, because it's Irish American, and Irish British, and Northern but Irish. This is more laser focused. This is right there. Yeah. And, and, you know, again, um, I've had to be respectful because I'm not in the tradition. I'm outside the tradition. And that's complicated as well, because if you call, say a Petri dish, that sometimes doesn't feel so good. And I, I can hear that. I can see that, right? So, but I've learned from the folks who are in the field and of the field, right? And that's interesting. But that also puts, right, is you don't think about yourself as what is my personal embodied relationship to this field. Right. Yeah. But if you ask Darwin, right, he could say, I am of this field. I'm outside of this field. Right. And I think one of the things that made him so good as a collector is that he was kind of outside his field and therefore he could see it from a different See it a little bit more objectively. Right. Right. And I'm not yeah. saying I'm objective or non-objective about right. my field, but I am constantly thinking about the question. That's interesting. Yeah, I just want to ask, like, why African American literature? Because I teach the Harlem Renaissance in my U.S. history class, and one of the things that I talk about is at the time there were a lot of these um, these like magazine owners and stuff like that that wanted to find good stories, and then it's like it's like a it's like a match made in heaven. And then there were a whole bunch of these black writers who had an amazing, powerful, emotionally like gripping story these stories to tell, and it just becomes like this blending. It, like, what was it about African American literature? Because you said, like, you don't have, you didn't grow up, you're not you're black. I don't know if you grew up in like a black community or whatever. Like, what was it that made made you go, you know what? This is this is really fascinating. I want to just dive deep. Because is it actually, I, I don't want yeah. once you answer that. But they, but the, what I say to my students is, find the thing that you love working hard at, and that's gold if you can find the thing that you will outwork the competition because you just love it like mm -hmm. i'm gonna put on another cup of coffee i don't want to go to bed because i want to keep working hard right. you will be successful no matter what that is and that seems to be your thing was is in african-american literature so how did you find it i think is the real valuable question for the listeners so it's a goofy story so yeah. one day I was at my mailbox waiting for my kids to come home from school. They were, I don't know, eight and 10 or something. And I opened up a New Yorker magazine and there was a piece by Henry Louis Gates Jr., uh, the Harvard uh, scholar and head of the African-American studies program there. Mm -hmm. And he had found a manuscript written by a black woman who, and it was a written manuscript and it was no dated and her name was Hannah Crafts and it was called The Bondswoman's Narrative, never published. 
And it was the story of her escaping from slavery in North Carolina and achieving freedom. And he's like, we got to figure out who this is because we don't know. And there's nobody in the database. It's called Heritage Crafts. And he did all of this research, like the pen, like it was obviously a quill pen because it was 1850 something. And, you know, what kind of goose? And they found out it was a goose that was around New Jersey, right? What kind of ink? It was a kind of iron gall ink. Like this is all this CSI stuff, right? That was in New Jersey. And he's like, so maybe this is true because, you know, it's all this, right? And I'm just sitting there waiting for the bus, reading this magazine. It's really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. And he says, he says, she's a beautiful writer too, because listen to this. And, and there was a paragraph where she's describing uh, Washington, DC. And she said, you know, gloom, gloom everywhere, gloom where it rolls over the Potomac, gloom, blah, blah, blah. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, that's the second paragraph of Bleak House by Charles Dickens which was fog, fog everywhere, fog where it rolls over the Thames, fog where, and I'm like, okay, how's this woman, what, what's she doing with Dickens and rewriting this? And then I'm reading a little more, then the bus comes and I'm like, get in the house, I got something to do. And I come inside and I pick out my copy of Bleak House. And he, again, Skip said in this New Yorker piece, he said, um, look at how she describes the slave huts. And it was this really description of squalor and, and awfulness and really bad stuff. And I, you know, look at my copy of Bleak House and it's Dickens' description of the London slums and some, uh, the way that, you know, people are, are having to live under terrible circumstances. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm reading the magazine. It's like, nobody sees all this. Nobody's getting this. Nobody's like, what is it that I'm seeing that nobody else is seeing? I happened to know some people at the New Yorker because I worked there for a while and I called them up and I ended up talking to Skip. He goes by Skip Gates uh, within the half hour. Did they and, connect? Or maybe you'll get to it. Okay. Right, no, I called him and, I, and he called me and, and he said, you know, I showed that to... I showed that to a dozen of the best scholars in African-American literature and nobody saw that. Nobody caught that. Why did you catch that? And I said, well, because I'm not an African-American literature scholar. I'm a Dickens scholar. I'm a 19th century. I'm a Victorian literature scholar. And he said, I want to work with you for the rest of my life because you know what they were reading. But what was interesting in this process is here's this woman, and I've worked on her a lot, and we found out, I'll tell you the story, it's a longer story about how we found out, how we figured out who, who she is. Um, it's this woman who was enslaved on this, on this plantation and wanted to learn to read and read everything that she what, learned around her, and when she was telling her stories, grasped this, these works of literature to tell her own story. It's not plagiarism, it was kind of like riffing or signifying. And we have figured out who she was. A guy named Greg Hekimovich has figured out who she was. She truly did leave. She went to New York. She took the name Bond. So her name is Hannah Bond, but she still called herself Hannah Crafts, crafting this story. And it really, it's really kind of, no, maybe it was her name was Bond. She took craft, whatever. But the point is she, she was a real person who really did this. And for me, the idea that you could express yourself and tell your own story with the building blocks of what you've read. That's my expertise. That is incredible. Do you know what that is? Is sampling. Yes, perfect. That's sampling. That's exactly. how, like, that's like exactly. the, the roots of, of, of hip hop. Yes. yes, yes, that was sampling. Wow. Like, no, it was incredible. funny because there was a lot of things like, oh, Henry Louis Gates found an author who plagiarized. No, no, it was borrowing, it was sampling. It it's was sampling. a whole bunch of other things. Yeah, it's and like, she well, did this in you, Where are you gonna get your building blocks from? Like, like, like kids in the hood didn't have in access to instruments and stuff, they had no. a record player. So they start yeah. scratching it, they start playing it and they start rapping over it. And exactly. she didn't have access to good education. So she grabbed, that is so cool to see Isn't that it? pattern. It's so wow. cool. She's so great. And, you know, I just, all I know her from is what she wrote and how she wrote and how she sampled. She sampled from everything. She's got some Jane Eyre in there, right? She's got some Walter Scott in there. It's really amazing. So that's my passion, right? I, I, I wasn't sure I was going to call it sampling, but yeah. No, that's, you know what? Um... Dr. Robbins, that, 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 that's going to stick with the, you know, when you hear something, you're like, I'm going to remember that forever. I'm going to make that connection forever when I think about music and I think about like the earliest African-American um, writers, that that's, that's the only way that they could get their building blocks was by sampling, for lack of a better term, 
yes um the the works of like the great the great writers that's that's really cool so this thing that's about cool. sonnets because i write about sonnets again it was a form that black poets found mm -hmm. right yeah. now how they got let me just connect it to what you said about the these uh, magazines and the harlem renaissance yeah. right when you think about the columns in a magazine right they got a little a sonnet fits right well right really well at the end of a column mm. so a lot of publishers were like uh, you know don't want these long complicated poems that langston hughes wrote it's like can you give me a sonnet because it really fits really well so part of actually uh the popularity of the sonnet in the black tradition is because it fit yeah, facially <laughs> yeah. oh that makes sense um just because we're coming up on an hour i do want to um ask you so the last line in the the piece that you wrote said i'm gonna i'm gonna quote it here it says what we need is future thinking to focus I'm sorry, I'm gonna start again. Take two, click. What we need is future thinking. The, the focus is not only on what makes a great teacher, but what will make that great teaching available to all. And that gets us into this concept of scale. I've had two guests on. Um, one is Casey Morris and she is a teacher. She does like teacher CEO, where she basically wants to make, um, make it give like ways for teachers to make more money. So it's a lot of like selling your lessons and stuff like that. And I was like, ah, still in the system. Then I had Miles Hunter on who was a, uh, he's a, um, a, a, like a capitalist, you know, whatever entrepreneur who wants to do, um, he did uh, tutoring and he said like, you know, we can scale tutoring as supplemental and whatever, but they didn't really hit. The question is about scale. You know, the, what we value in society, I say stuff like I got into a conversation with someone, they said, you know, we value, um, people who make apps that make you look like you're bald more than we do like social workers. And I was like, I don't think we value them more. I think that you make an app you cause you can code and you sell it for a dollar and you sell a thousand of them. Then you make a thousand dollars like that. But if you are taking care of people, that is hard to scale. Part of why I started this podcast, why I'm so active on social media and stuff is to try and figure this out in real time. How do we scale good teachers? I believe that I can teach well. I've taught the most diverse populations you could ever imagine in all these different areas, but I am held to, I can't teach as well on social media because I don't have that connection to like look the kid in the eye. I know you, I know what you're going through. Kids are struggling with all kinds of stuff, anxiety and depression is through the roof. The families are breaking up, all of this kind of stuff. I don't know how to scale it, but when you, when I read that, you're, yeah, yes, yes. But now this is the question, what is even, and I, I know I keep asking this, you're like, I don't know, but like, what are the steps to take to try and at least walk down the path to ask the right questions to get to the right answer, I guess. So if you look at historically, why, um, why in unequal societies, for example, um, the move for women's education, women's college and women's rights, right, is was tied up in education, was tied up that, you know, young children didn't always go to school, right? Education at home or a certain kind of education at home or education at home after, you know, a certain set step up to, you know, age whatever, was about, uh, most of the education a child would receive would be in the house. So you had to teach the, educate the women in order to educate the boys. <laughs> right, right. So that was a kind of scaling model. Yeah. Right. That every household had a teacher. Right. Mm -hmm. And, and in the Jewish tradition, you know, the idea is you would go, you'd go to your Hebrew school, you'd learn all the time. It was part of the tradition and it was a part of the tradition that's family based. Now, you know, the thing is about the, you know, quote unquote, breakup in the family and all of that, you know, it matters, but what really matters is whether you have a teacher in the family, right? It may be that a broken home with a teacher, quote, quote unquote, broken yeah. home with a teacher in the family is better than a quote unquote intact home to parents yeah. where nobody knows how to teach whatsoever. Right. Right. So part of the conversation I would say is the best unit for scaling teaching is the home unit, but that the conversation about who in the home is the teacher, I don't ever hear that happening. No. I really, I, I don't think I've ever said who in your home is the one that taught the kid how to read at age, yeah. whatever. Who is the one who taught the kid the colors? Does it naturally go to the mom? 
is maybe the dad is better. Maybe they're two moms, maybe they're two dads. It doesn't matter. We don't have that conversation because I think the first scale is the household. Yeah. Then we can scale other places. Well, and compulsory education, which obviously is good. Also, not, nothing's all good. This is Cylinder Radio. We got, <laughs> there's different perspectives. And the problem with, with compulsory school is uh, it's just outsourced. I mean, parts of parenting are outsourced. It's your problem, teacher. You teach them. That's why I pay my taxes. And it's just like one less thing for the parent to think about. And that's, you know, they've lost the sense of community. They've lost the sense of interaction with the school. Um, I just, well, the first compulsory yeah. education, right, is in Massachusetts, right, is in Puritan, Massachusetts, because parents weren't doing their job. Mm -hmm. And so the kid couldn't read the Bible. And if the yeah. kid's not going to read the Bible, you know, all sorts of variable things. So the first compulsory education is about the Bible. Now, I'm not going to say anything about my politics. They may be to the little left of yours or to the right of yours. I don't care. But you want to know something? I think the Bible is great education. And I'm all for it. I am all in, mm -hmm. right, on the idea of compulsory education with the Bible. Maybe different kinds of Bibles for different kinds of people. I don't know. But it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm all in on that. Well, at the very least, it's, it's, it's wisdom. Like, like, you can be an atheist. I've had a lot of atheists on the, on the program and things like that. But at the very least, you can't, it's very difficult to, you know, as a Jordan Peterson thing, I think he says something like, if you can write something better, then go for it. It's actually quite hard. These, these stories have been around for thousands of years and hold up and give people real meaning and real guidance in their life. So you want to replace that, like, good luck. <laughs> like yeah. it, the chance that exactly. you're replaced with something better that you're just going to think up something that has been around for thousands of years with people trying to extinguish it, by the way, and it's survived. Like do that at your own peril because what you replace it with might be worse, probably will be worse. Probably will be. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know, I don't know really where to go. I mean, should we, if we're going to try and scale this, if we're trying to get into home, do we need to just, promote it as a society more? Do we need to say like, you should care about education more? I don't hear it. I don't hear it brought up on, on 60 Minutes. I don't hear it brought up by celebrities really. What they do is they give me the, the, the lip service of like, you should be paid more than an athlete, Mr. Roosh. It's like, no, I shouldn't. Not until like <laughs> there is a value. You, athletes get paid what they are because they generate that kind of revenue. Like where, where, I guess, where do we start from here? Like, I hear you with, with, the, with the community, but like, what does that look like for the listeners? If they want to scale good education, if they want to say like, hey, education is really important. We need good teachers and we need them to get to as many as possible. What are the simple steps that we could take? Do you have anything? Yeah, <laughs> that's a, it's, it's sad. And I, it, I, part of my melancholy in, in listening to you is that let's go back to that 90%, right? Mm -hmm. I think having the conversation is gonna require a hell of a lot of job retraining when you say, you know what, you're not very good, you need to do something else. Yeah. And that is disruptive. And that will require parental, I don't think, and, and your, your experience says something to me that the creating of new charter schools isn't really solving the problem, right? Because there are good teachers and bad teachers in public schools, there's good teachers and bad teachers at private and charter everywhere, right? Yeah. So. Yeah that conversation has to end. Like if I, if, if, if Gates is listening, right, you know, if any of that, it's to say, let's do the study. Hey, you and I can do this study, right? Which is, let's get the best teachers. And if we got, if we identified a whole bunch of them, put them in one school, in, in a not so great neighborhood, mm -hmm. right? And just to do that, to say, you know, that we actually believe that most aren't good, Let's yeah. and try to train to that. But first, we have to use that 90% and 10%. It's really interesting that we came to the same figure from two different places. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I love the idea of let's, let's study it. Like, how do we even know? I, I hate school, which is part of why I'm doing it. But like I said, I'm not going to go back and get a PhD unless the only reason I would is if I go to like a program and I just say like, like, I want to learn what would be the best way to scale education. And I'm going to learn this on my own. I might as well get a piece of paper for it or something along those lines. You don't need a PhD. Let me just tell you. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need a PhD. Dean no. 
No, I don't, you don't need a PhD because the problem isn't studying this, right? Sorry about this, my phone keeps ringing. The problem isn't studying make, what makes good teaching. The problem is the politics of it, right? And you've got a great podcast here. You've got a lot of good listeners. Yeah. So let's focus on the fact that 10% are pretty good, are, are great, right? Yeah. I don't know how much are, there's probably a, a fairly good number who are good enough, mm -hmm. right? And what does that mean, good enough? It means they get the job done. You know, in all of my years uh, up to college, it you know, I get so important. It's so important and it's so not a focus and it's, it's just tough. But um, Dr. Hollis Robbins, this, is, this has been a great conversation. I really enjoyed it and um, I enjoy the stories and I just, I think that part of what I'm trying to do and I do this in my classroom is just like, I don't know. I don't know the answer and you don't know the answer. And yet we're trying to think about it. And if we don't know the answer and it's okay to not know the answer, then our students and the listeners and, and your faculty there can like go, okay, well then I don't need to have all the answers. I can more focus on asking the right questions, being curious, staying curious, and maybe we'll get there. So, you know, well, um, let me jump, jump in one thing. Please. Right? One of yeah. the problems, one of the problems for student evaluations is that you're almost always in a situation of knowledge asymmetry, mm -hmm. right? And the problem is that students can't tell the difference between knowledge asymmetry, which makes an okay, maybe not so great teacher seem great because the asymmetry is still there, right? So to start thinking, and I, I'd love to continue a conversation with yeah. you off the podcast on studying this, on studying what you called, what did you say? You are an expert at, at explaining complex things to teenagers. Yeah. I wrote that down, oh, okay? Yeah. That's extraordinary, okay? What skill set does that take? As you said yourself, break it apart right? Mm -hmm. Break that apart. Tell me exactly what it is that you do, explaining complex things to teenagers, yeah. right? Um, take your own lesson. And I think there's an answer there, right? I think there's an answer probably better in you than in me, right? Because I have a whole bunch of knowledge, knowledge, right? So I've got the asymmetry everywhere. You're doing it without the asymmetry. I mean, there's obviously asymmetry, yeah. but you're doing it based on, on being really, really good. So I bet if you focus on that, um, I'd support you getting a grant to, to try to figure out how to replicate that skill that you seem to have come at naturally and teach that. <laughs> Do you know what's funny is, um, is I talked to uh, Eric Weinstein before and he's you know, a super smart guy and stuff. And, and he was just talking about how he's, he admires like the way that I approach teaching and stuff. And I said, you know what my secret is? And I'll tell you too, because you guys are these high horsepower brains, super smart, super accomplished. My secret is I'm not that bright. And because I'm not that bright and, I, and you know, it's this concept of you take my, my dullness from my cold dead hands because that's, that's my ace up my sleeve is I don't understand this stuff and I got to figure it out. I have to make it simple for me. And if I have to make it simple for my simple brain, then I can explain that same process that I have to go through for myself, for my students. I think that's exactly right. By the way, I know Eric a little bit. Um, and one of, the, one of the characteristics and what I always pick on him for is his fam favorite pronoun is we. And he talks of in the we in a really funny way. Like yeah. we think this and we think that and we do this and we do that. And I think it's actually really inexact, right? Now I've been listening to you. I listen to pronouns, right? You use I, you use I a lot or you or them, right? And I, and I think that's part of what makes you a good teacher, right? Because there is no we, yeah. it really isn't, yeah. right? Right, there's you and the student, there's me and the student, right? There's sometimes, there's a kind of collective we in America, but that's not really a we. Right, we're a whole bunch of individuals. So anyway, that's my that's my yeah. little little jab at Eric. I mean, he's very 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 smart, but yeah. you know, there is no we in teaching. Yeah, no, it's yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot more a lot more personal. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This is great, and I look forward to talking to you more. And I'm I'm stoked that my audience can get exposed to you and your work. Um, is there a place that you like want to promote? Is it Twitter or anything like that? 
Um, yeah, Twitter I'm at, at anecdotal, which is which yeah. is um, because I I think anecdotes are are fine are fun. But let me just say the book that I was uh, yes. talking about, which Please. is Hannah Crafts, the Bondswoman's Narrative, is really worth reading for. And I'd love to to see if you ever teach it sometime to teach it as sampling. Um, I mean, my my Twitter account is kind of funny, random things, uh, and I don't tweet as a dean, but just as my liver That's of it. life. Yeah. as me. Um, but I really, when you read that, just reach out to me, text me and tell me what you think of that, um, of the book. Cause I, it's, it's a really extraordinary book that, that should be read more at the high school level. Absolutely. Yeah. Hannah Craft. I can connect it with kids in, who are into hip hop so easily. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank Great. you so Thank much for being so here. Much. I enjoyed this conversation tremendously. Same. Thank you. All right. Bye.